I don't know how to preach this message. The Lord put it on my heart and I argued with him. I said, Lord, this is really weird. It's, I came across the scripture I'd read before, but I know when the Lord is speaking to me, when he's, when he's, when he's wanting to convey something. So I'd like you, your homework assignment this week is to go home and read Judges chapter 19 through 21. Do you have your Bibles? Let's look at Judges 19 verses 1 through 4. In those days, Israel had no king. There was no king in Israel. It's inevitable in our lives, in a business, in a church, especially in a nation. It's vital to have strong leadership because in the absence of strong leadership, things can go awry very quickly. Bad things can happen in the absence of strong leadership. That's why God has called men to be the priests of their home. Fathers have a very specific instruction in Scripture on how to be with our kids and our grandkids. God wants us to be leaders. Strong Christian leadership is needed in the world today. Okay, so in those days Israel had no king. Now a Levite who lived in a remote area in the hill country of Ephraim took a concubine, and I want to straighten this out. When I was a kid, I asked one of my church leaders what a concubine was, and he said it was kind of like a prostitute. I didn't know. My whole life, I never asked again. I just, every time I read that word, that was the visual. But a concubine in those days, they did plural marriages. Now that's not of God. A plural marriage was never instituted by God. It came, as you research them, it came from the line of Cain. It came from a rebellious line. But either way, a concubine was when a man, when his wife got uh, to an age where she could no longer bear children, the man, so he could keep having children, would take a concubine. It was accepted then. Uh, it's certainly odd to us in this generation. But a concubine was a wife. It was like a second wife. So, Now a Levite who lived in a remote area in the hill country of Ephraim took a concubine from Bethlehem to Judah. But she was unfaithful to him. And she left him and went back to her parents' home in Bethlehem, Judah. After she had been there four months, her husband, husband went to her to persuade her to return. He had with him his servant and two donkeys. She took him into her parents' home, and when her father saw him, he gladly welcomed his, him. His father-in-law, the woman's father, prevailed upon him to stay, so he remained with him three days, eating and drinking and sleeping there. This is one of the strangest stories that you're going to read in Scripture, but I believe with all of my heart that it's got a very important message for you and I as believers in the church today because of what's happening in this nation. It's an incident that we're about to read that so outraged God's people at that time. It moved them into civil war. And it changed the direction of that nation. So a man and his second wife were traveling in Israel. As you read this story at home, you'll see that she kept saying, well, let's stop here for the night. Let's stop there. Every time they were you know, coming to a town, and he was saying no. He bypassed every city that weren't of his own tribe, of his own people, because it was very dangerous back then. People were very tribal. So he wanted to get to a city where he was surrounded with his own people, so they bypassed city after city, and they ended up going to a place called Gibeah. And back then, you'd go into the town square if you were a traveler. They didn't have hotels and, and you know, Airbnbs. 
Um, they, just, they had them, but they didn't have any way for anybody to book them, I guess. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. So they, they would sit in the town square. They'd go to where all the commerce was, and they would sit there, and one, a person would come up and say, hey, do you have a place to stay? No, we don't. Well, come stay at my house. And it was an honor to bring people into your home as guests. Even if they were total strangers, they'd invite them into their home, they would give them the run of the house, they got the best bedroom, they got the biggest portion of the meal. They treated people like family. So they went to the city square, and they were there, and it was long after dark, and nobody invited them in. And the guy, the traveler, thought it was kind of strange. And... They met this countryman, he came down, he was working in the hills, and he came down to go home, and he was a fellow countryman, and he said, uh, what are you guys doing here? Well, we're waiting for a place, to, you know, somebody invite us to stay. And the guy says, you don't want to stay here, it's dangerous in this part after dark. You come to my house. So he invited them, they accepted, and he even told them, uh, the traveler even said, we don't want anything, we've got, we've got straw for our donkeys, we've got water, we've got our own bread and wine, we don't, we'll take nothing from you, we just need a roof over our head for the night. So they went and they stayed with this man. They shared a meal together, they're relaxing after dinner, and all of a sudden, a gang surrounds the house. And they be, begin to hear yelling outside and pounding on the door. Look at, look at verse 22. While they were enjoying themselves, some of the wicked men of the city surrounded the house, pounding on the door. They shouted to the old man who owned the house, bring out the man who came to your house so we can have sex with him. It gets weirder. So, hold on to your hat. This homeowner has been living there for years and years. And the, the fact that this gang surrounded the house and started beating on the door, trying to break the lock off, demanding such an outrageous thing, didn't even faze him. It's like he was used to it. He begins to talk with the men and trying to reason with them. He had grown so accustomed to this kind of filthy behavior with the people of Gibeah, God's people that it didn't even faze him. He began to barter with them. He was so used to it, he started trying to make a deal with them. Look at 25 through 30. But the men would not listen to him. So the man took his concubine, the owner of the house, sent her outside, and they raped her and abused her throughout the night. And at dawn, they let her go. At daybreak, the woman went back to the house where her master, that translates into the word husband, where her master was staying. She fell down at the door and lay there until daylight. When her master got up in the morning and opened the door of the house and stepped out to continue on his way, there lay his concubine his wife, fallen in the doorway of the house, underline this, with her hands on the threshold. He said to her, get up, let's go. But there was no answer. Then the man put her on his donkey and set out for home. So this traveler the night before and the day before had been bypassing cities that might be dangerous for him and his wife until they could get to a city of their own people. And then this happens. Kind of reminds you of the situation of Sodom and Gomorrah. Same, similar situation. This is Israel. See, Sodom and Gomorrah were, were ungodly people. They were pagans. This is a type of, of Israel's Sodom and Gomorrah. And God wants us to see in this scripture, as you read through this scripture, I believe the Lord wants us to see how lawlessness and godlessness can bring destruction to a nation. Because that's exactly what happened. When the gangs couldn't get the husband, 
The man of the house gives him the traveler's wife. They take her away. See, the leaders in Israel, they knew about these gangs. They had heard from all of the other cities. They were very organized as a people. They were separated by tribe, but they were organized as a unit. They knew about these gangs, but they'd done nothing about it. They choose to just let them be. They didn't want to get involved. It was easier to sit back and do nothing. And they kidnapped the woman. They tortured her and raped her and left her for dead. But somehow she was able to muster enough strength to crawl back to the house where they were staying. And with the last bit of strength, she reached out and put her hands on the threshold of the door. And it was there that she died. So the next morning, the traveler, he opens the door. He sees his wife's bloody body lying there, clothes torn apart. He's probably remembering all the trouble that he'd gone through. He loved her. This was his wife. He had traveled for weeks to go get her back after they'd split. He realized she was dead and in his anguish and his outrage. He knew that it had happened because Israel, the leaders, God's people, had allowed it to happen by doing nothing about it, by being silent, by not doing anything about a problem that they know that they had. So in his anguish, look what he does in verse 29 and 30. When he reached home, this is the man with his wife on the donkey. She's dead. He's got his body with her. When he reached home, he took a knife and cut up his concubine limb by limb into 12 parts. And I'm not reading this because it's close to Halloween. That had nothing to do with it. I just now thought of that. I hope you don't think this is some sort of a Halloween message. This is a horrific true story that happened that God chose to put in Scripture. When he reached home, he took a knife, cut up his concubine, limb by limb into twelve parts, and sent them into all areas of Israel. Everyone who saw it was saying to one another, such a thing has never been seen or done, not since the day the Israelites came out from Egypt. Now look at these next three things. Just imagine. We must do something. So speak up. Notice the three things that he says to do. Just imagine. He's saying, think about it. Consider it. Think deeply about it. Think on this thing. Then get together and talk about it. Don't let the problem just go with nobody having a voice that comes against it. Talk about it and then you must do something. We can't just sit here and let this happen to our nation. We've got an obvious problem. We have to do something about it. And, in, and then he says, so speak up. Speak your mind about it. So the man took his wife's body and in grief and anguish, he chops it up and he sends one piece to each of the leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel. And he ta- attached a note to each part telling them the story of what had happened. And he said, you leaders, you need to confront this problem in our nation. He told them how he had bypassed cities and how he went to be with his own kind, a place where he should feel safe and comfortable. And then this happened. And he said, it's happening because you, as the leaders of this nation, are letting it go on. It's ungodly. It's got to be dealt with. Basically saying, my wife just suffered the consequences of you doing nothing. And this is something we see in the news every single day. We've got a problem in this nation. And it's, it's a problem with sin. It's a problem with, with the, the spirit of Antichrist that's going and spreading throughout the world. But there's things happening, laws being changed, things are happening in this country, and nobody is doing anything about it. In the absence of good, strong leadership, 
That's exactly what will happen. What's so powerful about this story is there's something about this husband's weird and extreme action that woke up the nation of Israel. This incident changed the direction of that nation forever. Israel began to take a stand against it. As you read this, they, they got together 400,000 Israelites with swords in hand, got together. And you'll see through a series of battles, you'll see what happened. That's a whole other message that I, I don't want to get off topic today. But they decided, bottom line, that they were going to fight back and do something about the problem. They said, we can't allow this perverted, ungodly behavior to continue in this country. And as believers, you and I, the body of Christ, Christians everywhere, our battle is not with flesh and blood. Jesus tells us that. We don't go out and beat people up because they disagree with us. Our battle is not flesh and blood. Our battle is with powers and principalities of the air. Our battle is a spiritual battle, not a physical battle. So the church needs to do exactly what Jesus did. Jesus came upon a spiritual battle. Remember when he just had fed 5,000 people, he's going across the sea, and the enemy was wanting to stop Jesus from going across to the other side. So a storm comes up out of nowhere, and the Bible says that Jesus rebuked the storm. Jesus would only rebuke something that he knew was demonic. So Jesus knew that that storm was demonic. And of course he rebuked it. And when Jesus rebukes the enemy, the enemy has to flee. The storm calmed down, the waves calmed down, he went on to the other side. And I believe the principalities and the powers of darkness in that moment, they yelled ahead over to the area of the Gadarenes where Jesus was going, and they said, we couldn't stop him here in the middle of the sea, so now he's all yours, you're going to have to stop him. And the enemy was waiting for Jesus, because the Bible says Jesus just pull, started to pull up on the shore, and a man possessed with many, many legions of demons, ran out of the tomb screaming, Jesus of Nazareth, what would you have to do with me? And he fell down at Jesus' feet. How did that demoniac in the tombs know that it was Jesus? Because his kind had tried to stop Jesus just a while before out in the storm. So we need to recognize that what we're dealing with in America today isn't just politics. It's not just people wanting their own way. It's not just people wanting a better economy. Or This is demonic. Can you feel the difference? It feels different to your spirit if you're a believer. The hatred is deeper and unjustified. Israel is being attacked on every front. The spirit of Antichrist is alive and well, not only in this nation, but around the world. And there is a hatred toward Christians and Jews like I've never seen in my lifetime. So we need to do, as believers, as individual believers, believers we need to rebuke the enemy in the way that Jesus did. Rebuke the enemy in the name of Jesus. Let him have no part of taking control over your thought life or your attitude. Just wake up every morning, have prayer, say, God, protect me today. Rebuke the enemy in the name of Jesus and any hold that he may have on your life. Because again, our battle is not of flesh and blood. It's a spiritual battle. Christians today more than ever, ever, need to be people of intense prayer, spiritual warfare. Because as a nation, we're in the same position right now that Israel was in this story, in the absence of strong leadership. America has abandoned biblical teaching. People say, well, we're, we never were founded as a Christian nation, and the Constitution says not. 
Jefferson signed the Constitution in the year of our Lord, 1776. What are you talking about? Of course, we were a Christian nation going all the way back to the Mayflower Compact in the 1600s. This nation belongs to God, and he has made the church believers, stewards over this nation. We've watched our nation being destroyed by evil people with evil ideas. Paul prophesied exactly what would happen. Look at 2 Timothy 3, 2 through 5. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despiser, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Oh, and listen to this part. It's the same way that the Laodicean church is described by Jesus in the book of Revelation. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. We're watching Scripture be fulfilled in real time in America right now. And I believe that this story and that what we just read, what Paul's prediction, Paul's prophesying of what the end times would look like, I believe that he's describing not only the world and the church of today, but he's describing people. He's describing individual people. And I believe there's a lot of people that are calling themselves Christians that fit this mold because they've become merely religious people. Because a Christian will say, Lord, I give you my life. I want my conduct to reflect you. I want to live how you want me to live. I want my line to li life rather to line up with the Word of God. You have to be spiritually blind to not see what's happening today and how we are adhering to Jesus' uh, prophecy of the last days as well as Paul's. Thousands of churches right now are doing everything they can to stop talking about the power of the Holy Spirit. They're saying, tone down that Holy Spirit talk. People think it's weird. Can't we just go to church and talk about the love of Jesus and all the good things like that and leave the Holy Spirit out of it? That's the kind of church I was raised in. The Holy Spirit was just like the lemon next to the pie. They didn't deny the Holy Spirit, but I didn't understand the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. And I didn't understand how to recognize when I'm under spiritual attack. I blamed everything on the devil. But most of the things that happened in my life was God trying to wake me up. And that's exactly what we see in the Old Testament with the children of Israel. When God would pull his covering from them and leave them to their own devices and their own desires, they would soon be conquered and placed in captivity. There's a lot of believers today that are in captivity and they don't even realize it. And this time, at this dispensation of time, the Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist, not the person of the Antichrist, but the spirit of Antichrist is spreading throughout the world like a wildfire. And again, you'd have to be spiritually blind not to see it. The world, as it becomes more and more de demonic, God intended for the church to become more and more spiritually conscious. You see what I mean? So as the spirit of Antichrist and hatred towards Christian grows, God intended for the church, you and I as believers, to get stronger in our faith and with more resolve. One out of four kids in America, I just looked this poll up on uh, Friday, one out of four kids in America have said that were polled have been sexually abused. Kids today, children, are committing suicide over things like not being accepted on social media. 
kids as young as 11 and 12 are deeply depressed about their body image. There's crazy, nutty parents all over the United States that are allowing their children to have plastic surgery and gender reassignment. That is a sex change. They're allowing their children to have sex changes or gender reassignment. There's a generation of young people today who've got their hands on the threshold of the church. They're bleeding and they're dying and they're waiting for the church saying, you're my last hope. And what are we doing? They're wounded and bleeding from the absence of good godly leadership in their homes, in their schools, in their cities, and in their country. It's time for we, the church, to stand up and become even more vocal about biblical truth. We cannot keep accepting sin. Things that are a stench in the nostrils of God. The church today is ordaining people that live a lifestyle that the Bible says is a stench in the nostrils of God. The church, we have got to get it together. Amen? Can I get an amen? It's pretty lonely up here preaching this kind of a message. But you know what? I don't care. I want to incite a spiritual riot in every believer within the sound of my voice. Spiritual indignation, righteous indignation. The same thing that, took, that drove Jesus to take a cord and fashion it into a whip and drive the people out of the church. My Father's house is a house of prayer and you have turned it into a den of thieves. Righteous anger, standing up not for what we like or dislike, but standing up for what the Word of God says. So like that husband, that traveler did, I want to take my spiritual sword, my Bible. I want to rightly divide the Word of God and send it out and preach the truth about all of these things that are plaguing America and plaguing the church and send it out to the leaders of this nation. Because I believe the world is wounding and killing our kids in the way those rape gangs in Gibeah in the story we re just read are doing it. You know what? We don't even recognize anymore I asked Casey to play a clip. It has nothing to do with the sermon, but I saw this at 4 o'clock this morning. Thank you, Casey, for answering my text. Because I thought, this is stupid. This is how far off, out of whack, America is. Just see if it hits you in the way that it hit me. Can we play that clip? My mental health was better, but uncontrollable movements called TD, tardive dyskinesia, started disrupting my day. TD felt embarrassing. I felt like disconnecting. I asked my doctor about treating my TD and learned about Ingreza. Ingreza is clinically proven for reducing TD. Most people saw results in just two weeks. People taking Ingreza can stay on most mental health meds. Only number one prescribed Ingreza has simple dosing for TD. Always one pill, once daily. Ingreza can cause depression, suicidal thoughts, or actions in patients with Huntington's disease. Pay close attention to and call your doctor if you become depressed, have sudden changes in mood, behaviors, feelings, or have thoughts of suicide. Don't take Ingreza if you're allergic to its ingredients. Ingreza may cause serious side effects, including angioedema, potential heart rhythm problems, and abnormal movements. Report fevers, stiff muscles, or problems thinking, as these may be life-threatening. Sleepiness is the most common side effect. Take control by asking your doctor about Ingreza. The world today is so in tuned that every other commercial is a commercial for a drug that can fix any problem you're going through. They recognize that in this commercial, the guy drops a screwdriver, another woman makes a weird movement with her face, and they recognize that as mental illness. 
So you make a little weird face and you're, you've got mental illness. They recognize it. They give you uh, disability for it and you have a medication for it. You drop a screwdriver. They recognize it could be tardive dyskinesia, which is a side effect of mental illness. They recognize it. But then a man can stand up and say, I'm really a woman inside and I want to be recognized now as a woman and I'm going to go into the college and play women's sports. Does anybody else see this? America is out of whack. We will not call out mental illness for what it is. Homosexuality, transgenderism is mental illness. Pure and simple. We've got a problem in this country because we will not call out things that are. We're just like the leaders of Israel in this story. And this man cut up his wife and sent the parts out as a drastic statement, a last ditch effort to get the leaders to do something. And it did. And as you read the story, it changed the history, or I mean, the, yeah, the direction of that, of that nation. But America is fighting right now for the right to continue. They want to go back and, and change the law again for the right to continue to murder babies. This country is swimming in the blood of billions of murdered children with no regard for life. Children are committing suicide. Parents are allowing child gender reassignment. All of these things. You talk about mental illness, but we don't call it that. Spiritually in the church, we stopped calling sin, sin. If you're... And I'm not even going to get into the specifics. You could fill in the blank. Sin is sin. The Bible calls it out. We need to recognize what God's Word says and adhere to it, no matter how uncomfortable it makes us. I've been told, I've been skewered in emails from people for preaching this kind of message, and I just don't care. Because it's truth. I'm not angry at anybody. I love everybody. I love the transgender people and the community. I've got friends that are homosexual and lesbian friends. I'm not attacking their community or whatever it is they call it. But I'm saying that that lifestyle is sin. And the church cannot flirt with sin. Our job as pastors and community leaders and church leaders in this nation is to call sin what it is and show people that for every temptation that they have, that God provides a way out, a way of escape. Because I heard one this morning about an hour ago that frightened me. Casey, can you give me the anagram again for the people... Yeah, there's this new thing. There's a new group of people that want to be recognized and protected. Their MAP. Thank you. What does that stand for? Minor attractive person. Child molesters want to be recognized as the victim. We're going to create a medicine for them next. What is happening in this country is the result of no leadership in the White House for generations, not just one season, I'm talking generations. You and I as believers, the church, the salt of the earth, we should be out there on every street corner saying it. What they said in this, in this scripture was, was, was recognize it and then do something about it. Speak up and do something about it. That is why the Lord gave me this message because we have one thing that we can do in the spiritual, we can pray. And we need to pray and be people of prayer as of never before. But there's one thing we can do in the physical, and that is vote. This election matters. It has nothing to do with the candidates themselves, what kind of people they are, or whatever. This is about bringing this nation 
picking whichever candidate. You may not like either of them, but pick a candidate that's going to bring us a little closer to being in line with the Word of God. Because I believe that will go a long way with the Lord. Because right now, in the direction that we're going, it's going to not going to be very long before I will be arrested for hate speech. I will be arrested from my home, like they're doing in Canada. They're arresting pastors in Canada for this message that I'm preaching this morning, calling it hate speech. But God put this horrific, terrible story in the Bible so we could take notice of what happens when a nation gets away from God and when we turn a blind eye to the sin that is among us. But now we are welcoming it. We're making a room at the table. Church, churches are ordaining it. All this is happening at the same time they're wheeling the Ten Commandments out of courthouses. They're making it illegal to wear Jesus t-shirts in school and take a stand for what you believe. You cannot take your Bible to school. Yet they'll make room for a Koran mat and let you pray however 12 times a day or whatever it is. Some, some people are getting, some religions are getting, uh, being accommodated, but Christians are being persecuted even in the school. These are just a few of the chopped up, bloody pieces of this dying nation. And we all need to recognize it for what it is. We need to wake up. You talk about a woke movement. We need to wake up, church. The church needs a woke movement. We need to wake up to what the Bible says. Amen? Amen. Praise you, Lord. Because God gave us this land. And He put us in charge as stewards of it. But we've, I'm so tired of apathy in the church. I'm sorry, you guys. I should have took my cold medicine or whatever it is. And I would have come. I'm sorry. I don't mean to be irritable. But I'm, I'm out there. I'm talking to children who know nothing about the Word of God. Yet they're in leadership at the local giant church youth group. It's a spiritual battle. Pure and simple. Forgive us, Lord. I want you to notice one more thing. as the world indoctrinates our children to socialism and communism, which emphatically tells them that there is no God and that all religion needs to be abolished. Those are the top tier teachings in socialism and communism. That as our kids are being indoctrinated, we need Christian parents. Most of us in here have grandkids. Most of the kids in this church are from broken homes. The vast majority of them are brought to church by their grandparents. Because it's our generation that is the remnant that we still recognize what's going on. But the younger generation of the church today doesn't see it because they've grown up in a church where they don't hear about sin and Satan. They don't hear about any biblical teachings like about the Holy Spirit or, or powerful moves of God in your life. They don't hear it because it's not being taught. So I commend you if you're bringing your grandkids or your great-grandkids to church. But we need every person here that has the ear of a young person to counteract what's being told to them by the world. And I will, as a, as a kid, I remember what my grandma and grandpa said. I remember what my mom and dad taught me. I can remember that. But we're on a, the, the third, coming up to the third generation where they've been teach, taught this, this, this watered down, milk toast version of Christianity and it's time to get back to the Word. Amen? 
Look at Judges 21, 25. This is how those three chapters end. Read them, 19, 20, and 21. In those days, Israel had no king. So it, start, it ends like it started in chapter 19. The Bible's making it clear that this was a time in Israel's history where they were absent of leadership. And there's two or three other sermons that I could preach on these three chapters, but not today. But in the absence of good leadership in the nation, things will fall apart. Judges 21, 25, in those days Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. It's time for us, the body of Christ, to do the one thing that we can do, and that is vote. This is not a political sermon. I'm saying, please, if you're not registered, register, research the candidates, see what they stand for, what they're fighting for, and vote accordingly. Amen? Amen. Let's stand.